Thank you. Thank you. But first, I need your collaboration, because I need to send a picture to my mom. OK, so I will do two pictures. Hopefully, you will use your happy face, and you will raise hands and do something. Three, two, one. And now, the other side. One, three, two, one. OK? Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so thank you for coming to this um, session that it is mainly focused on clean code or code quality. But also, I will give some insights from the AI-generated code. I'm so happy to be here. This is my second time. Last, time, uh, the other, uh, last year, I was here talking about Quarkus. Uh, and tomorrow, I will be talking about test containers. And hopefully, I will give you some introductions to Quarkus, too. Uh, I usually start my presentations trying to impact the audience with numbers. And I will start, well, this is not my salary. I will start with $2 trillion. This is the cost of poor quality code, but just only in the United States for one year, 2022. But you could tell me, hey, I'm not, I don't know, interested about this money thing. I'm a developer. OK, so then this is the time that we usually invest on trying to fix, find and fix errors four days per month and developer. Definitely, I think uh, the cost of poor quality code, well, you can agree with me that it is huge. I'm Jonathan Villa. I'm a uh, Java champion since 2020. I am also one of the leaders of the Barcelona Java community and also co-founder of JVC and Conf and DebBCN. Uh, it's a conference that we run in Barcelona uh, every year. So if you don't have any plans on mid-June, uh, Barcelona Beach and Technology sounds like a great idea. Last year, we had 1,000 attendees. Let's see what we have this year. Um, I've been a developer for more than 30 years, several languages, but I would say that the one that I love the most is Delphi. Anyone has used Delphi in the past? Yeah. The other day, I received a job offer about Delphi. I assume someone died or retired, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm, now I'm working as a developer advocate for Sonar. Please contact me using my Twitter handle or just scan this QR code and you will know more about me. Oh, I always re forget about this thing. Um, and Sonar, the company that it is sponsoring me to come here, and by the way, paying my mortgage. Um, anybody doesn't know what is Sonar? Two, fine. Three, for you, I'm gonna explain what is Sonar. Sonar is a company that has products to uh, statically analyze your code. Um, it has main, the main three products. SonarLint, that is the free plugin for your IDE, main IDEs. Uh, please use it. I've seen that most of the people are using SonarCube, but not SonarLint. And you can connect both. Please use SonarLint. It's free for commercial purposes, always. And it covers more than 30 languages at the same time. So it's why not? Then SonarCube, that is also free on the community edition that you can download or Docker run. And finally, SonarCloud, that it is the hosted version that is also free for open source projects. If you have your pet projects, you are in a foundation, please consider it because it's free. Uh, it also connects with several DevOps platforms. If you want to know more, just go to sonarsource.com or come to me. And I brought some swag uh, from Sonar, socks, uh, glass cleaners, pens, and stickers. Uh, after the talk, please come and, and take them. So this is the QR for the slides. If you want to follow the presentation, following the slides in your mobile phone, fine, perfect. The agenda, it's basically, I will try to explain what is poor quality code. 
and the cost of it, we've started seeing a number, but I will, I will mm, get deeper into those numbers. But we need a definition of clean code. Spoiler alert, it's more than a book, way more than a book. But what are the other things that I want to share with you? It's something that impacted me when I joined uh, Sonar. Sonar ha in their products, Sonar has telemetry. So it sends which are the issues more hit in different projects. I will show you which are the most common issues that projects out there are having. And hopefully, you will get surprised by some of them that you don't expect. Um, I will share some interesting hints if you want to follow the clean cloud approach and also uh, some um, Java versions, tips and tricks that maybe you don't know that are also part of the clean code approach. And yes, I will touch the AI. Why not, right? Um, and I will try to explain if AI generated code is that reliable, is that performant, or is it that secure? Spoiler, no. <laughs> then uh, I will show you some tools that you can use. Obviously, some of them are from Sonar, but there are others. The important point here that I expect you to get out of the room is, well, I will be happy if I can sparkle a light or light a sparkle of curiosity on you uh, towards clean code in order to explore more. Sometimes this is something that's super basic. Yeah, we give it for granted, but no, we shouldn't. Then I will try to explain which is the way. OK, now another, another question. Who is following the Mandalorian or has followed the Mandalorian TV series? Perfect. So you will understand that this is the way. And finally, some references if you want to go deeper into this topic. So, with uh, further ado, let's go into the topic. First, I want to introduce the monster of this, uh, of this talk because I will try to explain clean code with a story. A story about dragons, monsters, heroes, and who knows, maybe victories? Let's see. So the first step is to introduce Porky. Porky is our monster, a hydra of three heads. Scary or funny, I don't know exactly. But yeah, this is the idea. It's a monster, Porky. And what's the description of Porky? Well, basically, Porky is that project. Maybe you have heard someone suffering from a project like this, a project that has a lot of bugs, High coupling, so every time that you want to touch something, it's like, I need to touch a lot of things. Low cohesion, OK, I need to fix this domain. OK, let's find the classes across the code. But you also have some obsolete libraries that uh, you are uh, like very concerned the way that you need to update them. But you know that you need to update them. And Every time that you want to refactor and make things better or more performant, it's, it's super hard to do it. But is anything else for this project? Well, yes, it's about security. These kind of projects that are using third-party libraries that are not updated and that they are not put, the developers are not putting enough effort on checking the security when they are coding, those projects can have or can inherit CVEs. So you, you deploy them and whoops, you have lock for shell effect. Um, so it's, uh, it's also a very important problem for those uh, projects. My focus here is that clean code, it's not only about style, name, variables naming. No, it's way more than that. Also, not following the clean code approach, so our porky monster, uh, can lead to have projects with memory leaks. You have amazing 
uh, methods, classes. You are, not, you are creating, in some cases, manual uh, resources. And in sometimes, depending on the flow, you are not releasing them. So you can suffer from having resources in memory. Um, and also, low throughput because of those super big, uh, super big methods and classes that are doing too many things uh, instead of one thing that it is the desirable approach. But also, the important thing is that it's not deterministic, as it is, it is super complex, and it does a lot of things to find uh, an exact behavior or path of execution uh, in all the cases, it's very hard because sometimes there are collateral effects because, yeah, the complexity. So sometimes you have uh, paths that you, you didn't expect to, to walk. That can lead to use cases that are not covered. It's super complex to test these big methods so probably you are creating those tests that are easily doable. And some corner cases that would imply you to mock everything, uh, well, you are not doing them because it's super hard to do. So you are reducing the test coverage, well, not the test coverage, but the good testing uh, from your application just because of the complexity. So let's continue talking with about the cost. So I started the presentation with this more than $2 trillion, the cost of poor quality code. But just only finding and fixing bugs, it's, it's uh, more than $600 billion. It's a lot of money. I can think about two or three things that I could buy with that money. But now you can agree with me that the cleaner the healthier the code is, uh, the less bugs it's going to have. Therefore, it's going to cost less money to maintain. So it's super important also clean code for the cost of production of that uh, application. You have here the link uh, for the report on 2022. But this story has also a hero. I called her clean. But in fact, our hero is every one of you. So all the developers here uh, are the heroes of this story. So it's up to you to kill Porky. So now I need you to put that in mind. You dressed like a warrior, and you, are, you have to fight with Porky just to uh, solve this problem. And what clean does in a regular day? what you do in a regular day. You introduce new features. We are paid for doing that, right? You fix bugs. Maybe as happy as these people. Not my case. <laughs> but, but you have little time to fix tech debt and fixing errors. Who thinks that you have way more than enough time in order to fix tech debt and fix errors? Who thinks you have so-so regular time to fix tech debt and fix errors? And who thinks you don't have enough time at all to fix tech debt and fix errors? OK. <laughs> so maybe you can find yourself in this description. But also, there's another important point. And in my talk, I also put focus on uh, the personal thing. The personal uh, approach on clean code is not only about software. So you have to think that you should be amazingly proud to be here. It's not all the developers in Sofia that are here. So it's only you who is here that goes to a conference that invests the time being here. Who has attended meetups in the last six months? Okay, what happens with the rest? I have to say that for me, in my personal career, starting helping in a meetup and attending meetups is the best thing I've ever done. 
there's a story before the meetups, and there's a story after the meetups. I changed uh, company several times, increasing salary, role, experiences, knowing amazing people. Uh, definitely go to meetups. It's free. Uh, you will find a lot of good people, and you will improve your career amazingly. Well, just only focusing on the Bulgarian job, they have done 11 events on 2024. So it's like, come on, it's only May. So if you haven't attended their meetups, you are losing a lot. Here in J Prime, it's almost 1,000 people. <laughs> Definitely, you need to follow to, f to continue going to meetups and conferences. But also, I assume that one thing that you do is to rant about, about all code. Maybe not with those keyboards. I've used them, but maybe it's because I'm a bit old. Um, but just up to the point that you discovered that it was you who introduced that code. So this is the daily life in a developer. Is anybody here that doesn't fit in that description? Then who thinks uh, you fit in that description that I showed? about the developer. It, can, it cannot be mutually exclusive. So one or the other. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's after lunch. OK. So in this story, we have a sidekick. So now we have someone that will help us uh, to produce more and more code. I call, I call him eight for the AI and IDE. OK, well, uh, that was the name. So he is going to help us to produce tons of code. But let's talk about this code. So the code generated by eight, well, it's interesting to know that the growth of creation of the AI generated code is going from 10% last year calculated to 70% on 2027. It's a lot of code. It's only a 30% not generated by AI. Oof. Um, we have a lot of flavors, Copilot, Codium, Tab9, well, Gemini, and lots of them. You can choose from different uh, vendors to, to have these helpers. But the interesting thing is also that the acceptance rate, so every time that you ask, let's say copilot, do this, only 40% of the time people are accepting the suggested code. So it's a 60% of code not accepted. Yes, it claims to increase the speed, and apparently the reports say it increased the speed on 55%. That's fine. But another point that uh, concerns me a bit is juniors tend to use AI like 20% more than senior developers. We can think about, OK, maybe because they are more focused on non-complex tasks, or maybe because they are super used to use AI for everything. I will tell you a personal story. Uh, one month ago, I needed to take a pill. But I didn't remember what, which was the dose. So I said, took the phone, ChatGPT, which is the dose for this pill? What can happen? And ChatGPT Chat said, yes, uh, you can take three pills a day, 650 milligrams each one. Fine. So I did that because I totally trust AI. Uh, next morning, my wife asked me, did you take the pills? Yes. How many? Three. Three. It's one. <laughs> you, you don't know anything. ChatGPT knows. Well, I took the, the information in internet. Yes, effectively, it's one a day and 600 milligrams. 
So in this case, it didn't happen anything, but it could happen a very important uh, problem with code. Yeah, it's, it's important that we can create uh, a lot of damage if we don't check the code generated by AI. It's like Batman saying, did you commit blindly the code? And Robin said the same as me, but I thought it was always right. No, even GitHub Copilot says, please verify our code. So we need to check the code generated by AI. Following reports, it says that GitHub Copilot is only correct in the 29% of the time. So there's a lot of time that is not correct or is partially correct. With ChatGPT is different, but maybe because ChatGPT questions are not focused on code, so it, there, there is more uh, like an overall approach. But if we go to hard versus easy tasks, which is the issues that AI-generated code is introducing, well, we see that for hard uh, tasks, it intro is introducing almost 70% of the time issues. So I'm not trying to scare about AI. I'm trying to make you aware of the tool that you are using. There are several issues, maintainable issues, that are not breaking your code, but they are not following the clean code approach. Multiple variable uh, declarations, reassigning parameters. What can go wrong if you reassign a parameter? Um, for loops instead of uh, for each. Well, there are several. Uh, issues that can be introduced, but it can also introduce compilation errors, illegal indexes, null references, uh, undefined variables, you name it. There are several uh, issues in compilation time, well, compilation and runtime errors introduced by AI. I did an experiment. I said, let's try something easy. Just Ask Copilot, okay, generate a method that iterates a collection doing the sum of its integer value and calculating the average. Easy. So ChatGPT, well, Copilot returned this code. You can see on the right, on the right, this simple annotation is a plugin, a free plugin. I totally recommend it to you in um, IntelliJ that uh, is giving you the cognitive complexity of the code of that method. So it gives a cognitive complexity of 12%. But the, the nice point here is that Java, from Java 12, several years ago, introduced the Ting collector. With Ting collector, we just simply take a stream and we use this Ting collector to have this average value. So this is the consistent way of doing things because the language is providing a way of doing it. But Copilot apparently didn't know. Maybe because not a lot of people are using the team collector, so Copilot just simply gives what a lot of people has given. So, and in this case, the complexity is zero. And this is like a very simple task. So if we move forward with the uh, clean code approach. There are few goals for the software and the developers. And our hero hears that there is like the clean code warriors order, that they are super focused on fixing errors and complexity in, in code. And she wants to join them. And the principles are these four principles. So code that needs to be consistent, so using the same approach and the same naming and the same uh, solutions across the code base. Adaptable, because I assume that you are always using modular approach and not having a, an amazingly big monolith that every time that you want to evolve it, it's like a big problem. Intentionality, because we spend way more time reading code than writing it. So it's super important that when you read the code, 
you see which is the intention of the code very easily. And responsible, because yes, it's desirable that you don't break copyright laws. Uh, using AI, you never know. That's another important fact. But for the developer, it's also important. So it's not that we have a tool that checks or audits our code, and we just simply fix issues. That's not what, a, what clean code is in the end. Clean code also needs to imply that you are confident after committing your code. It's not that you are committing the code and then expecting a lot of uh, conversations in the pull request. But also, you need to be proud that the quality of the code is good. And finally, this will produce uh, that you are skilled every time, that you improve as a developer every time that you introduce new code. So our hero thinks, OK, let's see. I need to go and fight Porky. But it's that bad, the situation out there. Maybe it's not that important. So taking into consideration the 1,800 million issues that we have in the sonar telemetry, I will focus on the top 10. That is like more than 500 million issues. And the most detected issues are, first, cognitive complexity. Most of you are, know about the concept of uh, cyclomatic complexity, but there's another concept, cognitive complexity, that I will explain later, that gives a better idea of how complex is the code. But there's also a lot of unused code. Local variables, function parameters, private fields, private methods not used, imports, commented out code that you never know if you need to uncomment it or you need to remove it. It's a mystery. A lot of uh, to-do tasks in the code. There's an example of an Apache Foundation project that has a to-do that uh, is more than 10 years old. I assume that one day they will fix it. Meanwhile, to do. <laughs> OK. Raw types used in Java, apparently a lot of people are using collections without specifying the type for the element. This can give uh, runtime errors, hard to debug. So it's important to, to use that. String literals duplicated. So every time that we need to replace that string, we will need to do lots of uh, replacements. So it's better to just uh, use constants. And generic exceptions thrown, it's better to use specific exceptions that the consumer knows how to do or what to do and how to deal with them. And reference to null, this is classical. A lot of uh, objects used without checking if they are null or not. These are like the, <coughs> the groups about these issues. But there is also several security issues in this code. Unsecure passwords generated inside the code. So they are easy to break. Uh, also, uh, execution injection in XML parsers. We need to check for that if we are consuming XMLs. Well, maybe nowadays we are not. But yeah, there are lots of old applications out there doing that. Endpoints vulnerable to cross scripting. Also, we need to check for that, because if not, yeah, we are going to suffer. And credentials are coded. A lot, a lot, a lot of issues regarding credentials hard coded. You know that there are lots of bots that are checking GitHub repositories and just taking the uh, credentials and then using them to do not expected uh, uh, executions. So it's better not to have credential hard coded. And also, in some cases, we are using values from coming from the user in order to explore the path. And in some cases, if we are not sanitizing this path, we can suffer from path injection. So the situation is that we have a lot of dead code, vulnerabilities, null handling, also design regarding complexity, error handling, comments, and complexity. 
So our hero decides to, yes, I will go and fight Porky because it's important to do it, but I need to be trained. So I need some hints. In terms of vulnerability, instead of hard coding credentials, just use third party libraries that will take care of those credentials. With database operations, don't use a string concatenation, use parameter injection, and then you will not suffer from SQL injection. With HTTP request redirections, if we are using values coming from the user, sanitize them or use like a valid list of destinations. We can have discussions about this, but this is what we think. Um, in some cases, people are creating the hibernate entity in order to store and retrieve data from the database. And then this entity goes up from the connection to the database up to the REST endpoint. The suggested approach is use a DTO in the REST endpoint and then add values from the DTO to the entity as needed. If not, you can suffer from unexpected fields in the entity that have been populated by the user, and then you are going to store them uh, and have bad results. Always use DTOs instead of the entity uh, up to the end. I used a, a tool called Mapstruct that is super fine in order to do mapping between the DTO and the entity. <clears throat> in terms of bugs, uh, how many people here use Spring? Okay, first thing, check Quarkus and Micronaut. This is the best thing you can do now. Second thing, if you have a um, Spring Boot application or you have the component scan, be sure that you are uh, putting the right value because if not, using the default package will mean that Spring is scanning the full class path and even itself. So if someone puts a jar there, then you can have unexpected results. If you need to like block a thread, it's important that you don't block the thread. You just simply release the lock. Uh, and for do that, instead of doing the thread slip, use the wait method and then that thread will be reused for another operation. This seems a very uh, obvious thing. Um, the method on the left is a test, and it's going to be green. Everything is fine in that method, except that there is no condition in the assertion. So green, fine, move forward, submit, merge, deliver. Um, the point here is that, yes, we need to add a condition. But sometimes it can be hard to spot if you have like uh, big methods that are testing this. And the same happens if you don't even have any assertion at all. You have a test that is green, but it's not doing anything. So again, yes, this is obvious, but sometimes it can be, uh, it can be slipped into our code. Again, as I said at the beginning, with resources, if you have resources that are auto-closable, just you use try with resources. Don't do a manual release of the resources that you have created. Because if not, sometimes you can miss the release uh, point. Regarding design and complexity, let's talk about cognitive complexity. Both methods have the same cyclomatic complexity. For me, the left one is way more complex than the right one. Who agrees with me? But both have the same cyclomatic complexity. If we want to have something that warns us if someone has introduced super complex code, this is not working for us. Instead of that, we have cognitive complexity that takes care of indentations and breaks. Now, the left part has a cognitive complexity of nine, but the right part a cognitive complexity of one. 
that makes more sense and it's way easier to detect when someone has introduced complex code into our repository. But you need someone to calculate this cognitive complexity every time. There is also another issue that involves having a lot of depend dependencies in a class. So every time that you touch any of those classes, it's going to impact in your class. So again, it's something that you need to fix. Methods that are super big, that are going to be super hard to test. So just break it into several smaller methods. In some cases, we are even using parameters to, def to decide which is the path that the code is going to follow. Um, these are called uh, selector arguments. This makes testing way more harder and also uh, reading the, the code is more difficult. So instead of doing that, just have the methods separated and then the branching is done from the consumer. But also there are some things that we need to take into consideration depending on the Java version that we are using. So if we are using Java 12, don't use a regular switch expression, switch uh, sentence. Just use switch expressions. It's way clearer to understand the right part than the left part. And we are avoiding the problem of missing one break in the, in the middle of the code that will definitely impact the result. But if you are using Java 16, if, and you were doing a stream and map and so on. After that, if we wanted to have like, the list, um, the collector's to list was giving, returning uh, a modifiable list. And we know that we need to go as far as we can uh, into the unmutability. So, if we wanted to have something that was unmutable, we needed to specify two unmodifiable lists. But now, a stream has a direct method that it is two list, and it will return an unmodifiable list. So it's preferred to use this approach. Records. So instead of using classes where you have to define getters, setters, just use records, and they are unmutable, final and uh, way to go every time that you are representing data elements. There's a tricky one. With Java 19, they introduced a method that before this, if you wanted to have a number of elements in a hash map, you would say, OK, I will use the constructor saying I want one million elements in the initialization part. Java was not ensuring that that million elements is going to be created. Now, with this new static method, new hash map, now you can be sure that this million elements is going to be created at that time. So, well, in summary, my point with all of these maybe boring uh, issues is to overwhelm you. Is that you reach the point to, wow, there's a lot to do. I need to check a lot of things. I need to... Uh, even check our internal rules and conventions. I have to do it every time that I code and every time that I do a pull request. Just only considering the number of rules that Sonar has for Java is more than 600. For JavaScript, also more than 600. Python, 400. So you need to have all those rules in mind if you want to be sure that you are going to deliver clean code. But our hero, Clean, asks, to herself, OK, but I'm alone. Are there any weapons that will make my life easier? Yes. So we have static analyzers. We have Sonarlint, but you have others. You have PMD, CheckStyle, Findbacks, and others. It's important to have a static analyzer that, that checks your code as you are coding, not in an extra step, just as you are coding. For Python, there are other uh, analyzers. JavaScript, ESLint. So it's important to have a static analyzer installed in your ID and not expect that you will have time afterwards to check and fix that uh, code. 
And a good point in a static analyzer in your IDE, it's not that simply warns you about that, the issue. It's also that you see you have an overview of the list of the issues that you have. But also, on the right part, you have the description of the issue and the way to solve it. And it's important that you read that. Not just simply do a quick fix or just fix it, but that you read from the issue and you learn from it. It's important that you increase your uh, skills. But also companies need something that ensures that the code that is going to be merged, it's, uh, it's clean code, so they use uh, quality gates. There are tools like SonarCube, for instance, or SonarCloud, but there are others that you can also check that they are going to do an analysis on the overall project. They will check the, the issues, and if it's compliant, it will allow you to merge it, and if not, it will reject the merge. So basically, there are three uh, focuses. It's clean as you code. So as you are coding, you are going to have clean code. You don't have to wait until someone complains in the pull request. This makes you way more confident that the code that you are submitting to the pull request is good, and you will reduce a lot the number of messages and conversations on the pull request but also that you learn as you code. So every time that you find an issue, you read why is this an issue and the way to fix it, and you improve yourself. Even you can have it in the team retrospective just to put in common and learn everyone from those issues. I'm going to uh, finish the presentation. And there is, only, there is also one point for our hero that is very important is, OK, I have 3,000 issues in my project. Now what? Because if we are going to create a sprint to fix them, you know what happens. Um, so yeah, there's uncertainty. Our hero has a lot of fires, a lot of issues around. So what does she have to do? Well, basically, focusing only on new code. Just uh, using SonarCube, for instance, you have two tabs, overall code and new code. And in the new code, you only see the issues that you have introduced from the last version for a, some, a certain number of days and or specific analysis you decide which is the definition of new code. But you are focused only on new code. And why? Because as everything in life that is alive, code also dies. In this graph, we see that code introduced in 2010 is no longer present in 2018. But the same with the code in 2016 is way less in 2022. So the, uh, it's said that around 20% of the code is changed every year. So what's the point on trying to fix all code if this code is going to die? So if you focus only on new code, eventually after a few years, your code will be clean. So just focus on clean code. This will reduce also the friction if you try to introduce this kind of tools. In my experience, every time that I try to install Sonar in my past companies, uh, we were super happy and proud about our project one day. Uh, and we were so depressed and so overwhelmed the second day after installing Sonar because it was like 3,000 issues. OK, remove it. We will return to this blind happiness. Um, so it's super important to focus only on new code. Just to finish, there are two approaches. Trying to fix all the issues that you have in your project, that is the overall approach. Lots of them, thousands of them, if you don't configure the uh, quality gates and the profiles, or chopping ahead every time. This is like the point that I would love to, uh, that you, 
get out the room with this idea. So it's important to focus on new code and try to make clean code for the new code that you are going to produce. Forget about the old code. Conclusions, well, basically that not using clean code is going to impact, obviously, in the software, but also in money time and reputation of the company and morale of the team. So this is not only about software. This is also about the company and about the people. That it was clear that we don't have enough time to fix issues, and we are postponing this, uh, this epic. But that following the clean code approach will impact positively software, company, but most importantly, in you you are going to be more confident, more happy about the code that you are submitting. And you don't need to focus on lots of uh, methods and classes, just only on the commits that you are going to, cre to create from tomorrow. Also that we have lots of uh, rules to check for every code that we submit, lots. In, the, in our case, SonarLint is checking more than 30 languages at the same time. So it's, at least in my experience, it's common to have Java um, code, uh, JavaScript, TypeScript code in the same project, and also the deployment uh, files for Kubernetes or Docker. SonarLint will check all of them. You don't need to change from the different, uh, the different tools. And it will upload the issues to uh, SonarCube in that case and also will download the configuration from SonarCube. Several tools will help you on this, from the IDE to the CI CD pipeline. And also that only a portion of the time of the code survives uh, every year. So the best idea here is better focus on new code. These are some references that if you want to check them, uh, there are links to the reports that I used in the presentation. And that's being all. Here you have the slides. You have the feedback you are. Please, 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 report for please. Uh, rate me. If it's a bad rating, great, because I will learn. Uh, and if it's a positive rating, thank you, because it will, I don't know, increase my ego. So thank you very much, and hope you enjoyed. Yay. Awesome. OK, guys. So I'm talking from backwards now this time. I'm here. Can you hear me? No. You see, you're so much puzzled. Ah, that's a joke. Anyway, I'm here. Watch forward. Watch forward. Rotate, rotate. OK. <laughs> <laughs> now I see you. Yes. So uh, once again, so we think that questions uh, maybe not a good idea for everybody. So uh, Jonathan, you will be around two days. So I guess if you have any questions, Jonathan is always eager to help. I know him so good. So Jonathan, awesome talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Remember, tomorrow I give a talk about test containers also here. Thank you. <laughs>